At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. With the state's economy still trying to recover, and issues like a newly proposed state water project and gun violence hotly contested before the legislature, Senator Darrell Steinberg joins us today in our partnership with the American Leadership Forum to discuss the issues that confront Sacramento and the state. His thoughts on his beloved teams, the Sacramento Kings and the San Francisco Giants, and his ongoing fight for mental health awareness and treatment. Welcome back to Studio Sacramento, Senator Great Steinberg. Great to be with you, Scott, always. Well, you know, the burning question is, what was it like at the end of those negotiations on the Kings? Well, I was back in New York City for um, one of the key meetings. And, um, you know, I give so much credit to Kevin Johnson and the ownership team. And uh, I was very happy to have played a role. You know, I'm first president pro tem of the Senate from Sacramento in 125 years. And my role was to, one, give a little bit of the history uh, of, of g all the way going back to 1997, the first time the Kings sure. almost yeah. left. And secondly, to talk about all that we are doing in California and will continue to do to streamline the regulatory process, the environmental review process for infill projects like the uh, downtown Sacramento arena. But how, how, did, how did you guys pull that off? I mean, you've got these billionaires. I mean, the, the guy who runs Microsoft, these billionaires up there, and Seattle has all that wealth up there, and then Sacramento. I mean, the people true. across the country said it just couldn't be done. This is a very competitive community, and it's never say die. Um, like I said, this has been going on since 1997. Uh, one or another effort uh, to take the Kings, especially over the last couple of years. And, you know, there have been a couple of times where we have been on the verge of losing uh, this great asset. And we weren't going to go down without a fight. And we did not. And, and I think the key was, we said it from the very beginning, this was not a question of expansion, Seattle versus Sacramento. I'd still take Sacramento, by the way. But this was a question of relocation. And the burden that the NBA put on us was, can you get this downtown arena project done? The mayor put together the team. The NBA was very helpful. I played my part. The community played a large part. And in the end, um, the only result that I consider just from the beginning occurred, the King State. When did you know? But when did you know you guys had turned the corner? Well, I'll tell you, in that meeting in New York, I had a very good feeling about it because, you know, I've done a few jury trials and been before enough legislative committees <laughs> to read body language. And, uh, and the owners asked pointed questions, but I could tell that they were satisfied with our answers and they recognized just how committed this community is in, a, and continues to be in keeping the kings. And I added this element. This project is going to be blocks from the capital of the ninth largest economy of the world. And we should have a billion dollars worth of private investment. We should have this kind of facility in the capital city. I've never, heard, I've never heard that argument before. I like it. Question for you though, what does this mean? What does this victory mean psychically for this region? Well, Get past the numbers. You know, on the one hand, I have never believed in, you know, the so-called inferiority argument about Sacramento. I know I chose to live here 30 years ago to take a job. The job didn't work out, but I, I stayed. And I think that's true of so many people. It's a wonderful place to live. Having said that, this was an incredible psychological, moral boost to this community. I mean, it shows that uh, we can realize our dreams, that we can go for it, that the downtown does not have to, it doesn't always have to be a question of when is it going to get It's like we dared the better. impossible, right? Dared the impossible. We went for it. Um, you know, we had good, solid leadership and a community that was behind us. And um, I, I think it's a, just a great boost for Sacramento, but it's more than psychological. 
when I think about a billion dollars of private investment into downtown Sacramento, I, I know that this is going to be the catalyst that is going to complete the transformation of the downtown. The location is great. And, you know, I just imagine... Um, Would you say it's a better location than the rail yards? I think it is a better location than the rail yards. I, I think uh, that downtown location uh, is a better location. I, I think it will be more consistent with the continuing transformation of downtown. The rail yard start, site would have been a great site too, but I like this better. And imagine, uh, this is June of 2013. Imagine June of 2017 or 18, the NBA Finals, you know, <laughs> at our downtown sports and entertainment complex. It may take a few years, but uh, imagine the, the thousands of people leaving work downtown, taking the light rail, uh, attending an event like that. And they're going to be, you know, it's not just the Kings. You've got Disney. You've got all of the other uh, entertainment so, opportunities for so people. So at the in the final analysis, you know, this was a more unlikely than likely scenario yeah. to have played out, at least from the minds of all the people who wrote about this across right. the United States. That's what who, deser it, who deserves the credit? Well, I think the mayor deserves the lion's share of the credit, and he has received it because, um, you know, talk about a right guy uh, at the right time. Um, you know, the former NBA All-Star comes home to his uh, native city, loves the city, uh, has the contacts with the NBA, and certainly had that indomitable will to help make this happen. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, I also credit the larger community because uh, what the NBA knew is that Sacramento has been, uh, through the good times and the bad, a very loyal, loyal fan base for, uh, for the NBA. And, you know, the fact that we came from behind, the fact that no one expected us to win, makes it all that much, makes it all that much sweeter. <laughs> let's, let's talk about some If it were ones. easy, it wouldn't be worth doing. There you go. Well, since we're talking about things that aren't easy, let's talk about the legislature. Yes. Um, never easy. <laughs> but always interesting. Always interesting. Always interesting. You are known as a guy who does heavy lifting on big issues. And one of the things that's happened most recently is we had the tragedy in Newtown and that affected you profoundly. What did you learn from that experience that you brought back to the work that's going on in the legislature? Well, as you know, uh, I've been committed to this issue of improving the mental health system in California for many, many years. I think it is one of the forgotten issues of our time and that it is inextricably connected to every other social and educational problem uh, that we have in this society. But because of stigma, because we don't like to talk about it, it tends to not get the attention and it certainly usually falls to the bottom of the budget priority list when it comes to state and federal budgets. But a couple things have happened uh, over the last year. There was the Newtown tragedy where everybody asked, why didn't somebody see the signs in this guy, Adam Lanza, from Connecticut and do something to intervene further. But it wasn't just that incident, Scott. It was also what happened in Sacramento with the terrible story of Nevada busing a mental health patient to California and, uh, and leaving him, uh, essentially, for the cops to pick him up. Why is that important? Because it shows that Nevada, for one, um, has substituted for a decent, cost-effective, compassionate mental health system, uh, putting people on a Greyhound bus and dumping them in another state. And I think that, that speaks to the gravity of this issue and why more attention, public policy attention, must be paid to building a better mental well, health let system. Me, let, let, me though, let me give you sort of the devil's advocate position sure. on this. <clears throat> that busing of that patient, in part, some might say was driven by the fact that we provide a better a safety net in California than Nevada does. And you're the father of Prop 64, which 63. was 63, which is the millionaire's tax. Correct. And which provided a, a, a new floor for providing community mental health care services. So, in fact, it, so, you know, some might say that, in fact, we're becoming a magnet now because of the fact that we're providing more services. Absolutely no excuse for what Nevada did. Every state needs to have a mental health system. And will we back off on providing services because they choose to act in that way? Never. 
as long as I'm around. Uh, but our work is not done here. So, so Newtown, the Nevada story, uh, compelled me to, in my last two years in the legislature, and with a slight budget surplus, not much, but a little bit, to say, if we can invest a little bit of money, where should it be? Now, you said I authored Prop 63. I'm very proud of it. It generates a billion dollars a year for the kind of system that we want. 25% of the money spent on prevention and early intervention, 75% spent for now 27,000 people currently who are the most seriously mentally ill who need the full array of services in order to recover. But here's what's missing. During the same time Prop 63 has grown, we have lost hundreds of millions of dollars out of the pre-existing funding because of budget cuts. So while 63 has these wonderful services, there aren't enough people getting to them. Instead, what we're finding is people showing up at emergency rooms, people cycling in and out of jail, people showing up at wonderful uh, facilities like Loaves and Fishes who are so uh, overwhelmed. But is throwing more money at it? Is well, don't want to just throw more money. Here's my proposal that we'll be taking up as part uh, of the budget uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, I propose that we spend money smartly, that we spend it to build 2,000 crisis stabilization and residential beds in California so that people don't have to stay in emergency rooms or in jails if they are suffering from a severe mental health episode and need to get stable. Secondly, I'm proposing that we fund 600 triage workers throughout California who will be stationed at emergency rooms and at jails and at social service facilities to assess people who come into contact with the system, to refer them to a bed, and then ultimately to case manage them to the level of service they need. The mental health system desperately needs in this kind of infrastructure to link people who come into contact with various parts of the system and mental health services. Okay, but can you make the business case that this is ultimately going to be something that's sustainable over time? Oh, I It's absolutely. not just going to ratchet back the minute we hit another budget crisis? Well, first of all, the bed, building the capacity for 2,000 beds only takes one-time money. It doesn't take ongoing money. How's the governor uh, feeling about that? The governor, um, I think, is going to support this because here's one of the things that the governor in the state faces as well. Prison overcrowding. The federal courts have told us we have to further reduce our prison population. The counties are saying, oh my God, you've already done realignment. The sheriffs are saying we can't take any more people in our county jail which begs the most important question. How do we keep people out of jail and prison once they are inevitably released? And I say one of the key answers is to invest in a better mental health system because so many of those folks come out of jail, uh, end up in jail or prison in the first place because of untreated mental illness and untreated substance abuse. Okay, let's come back to Newtown. Go. And part of the argument that the NRA has been making around the country is that if there was a better mental health safety net, now this is interesting, you know, you have some strong allies, I think, uh, potentially on this issue from the Rifle Association. I'm not sure about that. You're not sure about that. But go ahead well, with your question. We've invited them on. <laughs> they, they, I'll ask them when they finally decide to come Okay, on. good. But um, in, in fact, would a better mental health care system have stopped tragedies like this one? Would they have made a difference? Yes. Yes. I mean, so? let me tell you about a couple programs going in Los Angeles, for example, a Prop 63 program. Law enforcement is working with the LA Unified School District on a program to help identify kids who have uh, either said something or issued a threat or acted in a way that makes the school official, the teacher, the principal feel that they may be at risk. The, the schools, together with the mental health community, are immediately getting those young people into treatment, into care and treatment. And they're doing it in a way that respects their privacy, but that gets them the help that they need. Dozens of kids are getting that kind of help now in one program in Los Angeles. In Sacramento, the UCD Med Center is piloting a Prop 63 project to identify kids between the ages of 12 and 25 who because of either family history or behavior at school have shown signs of potential serious mental illness. They're getting th those people into treatment early. 
All of that kind of early intervention prevents tragedies from occurring later. Now, you what about what about on the gun side of the equation, though? Well, is there is there something that needs to be done on that? Well, um, we're leading, and I'm leading as mm -hmm. well in the Senate on a comprehensive uh, gun reduction violence package. My bill is to actually require that the assault weapon ban that California passed in 1989 have real meaning. Because what the gun manufacturers have done, right now, detachable magazines are, are essentially banned in California. You can't take a magazine out of a long rifle, reload it, and spray hundreds of bullets. But the manufacturers have found a number of loopholes, a bullet button exception where they can, with a tool, they can remove a magazine that's not intended to be detachable. My legislation will clean that up and say that no gun manufactured going forward can be capable at all of having a magazine removed. There are seven other bills in the package, but where I depart from the NRA um, is that it's not either or. We need a better mental health system, but it's not a substitute for reasonable uh, gun violence regulation let me, as well. Let me, but is there a point where reasonable gun violence legislation needs to end. I mean, at, at what point is it okay to own firearms? I it, mean, let me be real clear. I, I believe in the Second Amendment, and I believe that people should have the right to own firearms. What we're going after are the loopholes that exist that allow the purchase and the use of these automatic weapons, these assault rifles, that have no utility for sport, that, that are not necessary for uh, protecting yourself in the home. So there is a distinction between lawful ownership of guns, either for protection or for hunting and fishing, and the proliferation of these kinds of weapons that we have seen over and over and over again used in these terrible tragedies. It wasn't just Newtown. It's Aurora, Colorado. <clears throat> it, it, you know, it was Norway. You go back and look at these incidents over the last several years, and, and the public is on our side. Because I think the majority of the public says, yes, if people want to own a gun, that's their right. But common sense tells us there's no need for the kinds of weapons that are available for purchase here in California and in the United States. Maybe not, but on the other side of the equation, the, the folks who argue against further gun control measures they state that the current laws aren't even enforced right now and that we just keep layering more and more restrictions that frankly won't get at criminals. And so the only people that they restrict are the normal citizens that you represent every single day. Well, let me day. tell you one of the gun, other gun bills we passed in this session that the governor signed. We appropriated $25 million to the Attorney General of California to uh, be able to beef up her effort to go after the estimated 40,000 guns in California that are sitting in the homes of people who are legally prohibited from owning them. The NRA opposed that bill. Really? They opposed that bill. So uh, where's, the, where, where's the reason and the common sense? So it's not just about banning assault weapons going forward. It's also about collecting the guns who are in the hands, again, 40,000 guns in the hands of people who, by law, because of criminal background, because of, uh, of some other prohibition, are legally prohibited from running guns, have them now. We, this year now, have provided the resources for the Attorney General to go get those guns. So the whole, uh, the whole issue of gun violence, you know, part of what kicked off this conversation was going back to the schools. Yes. And Schools are an area that you have focused a great deal on. And as a matter of fact, one of the, the initiatives that you've been working on, so much so that you took the entire Senate down to Long Beach, down to Long Beach. is this concept of linked learning. What is it and why is it so important to you? Linked learning is combining academic rigor, high standards in high school with career application so that every young person gets the, the basics to be able to qualify for either college or uh, a licensing apprenticeship program. But at the same time, they get some real world and real life experience and the courses are taught in a way. So this is like vocational school or? It's not, it, it's, it's a modern, modern form 
of vocational education. And the modern uh, word is, uh, is important for me to emphasize because voc ed was a great program and it got lost with the budget cuts. And I think we need to bring, uh, we need to bring it back, but with a, with a refinement. We don't want to get into a situation where young people, because of their background or because of their race or their ethnicity, are tracked, you know, at the eighth grade. Well, you're not college bound. You're not smart enough to go. You're not smart enough to go. Therefore, you're going to do voc ed. Mm -hmm. Unacceptable. But we don't have to present that false choice if we use a little bit of imagination and creativity. Because by combining academic rigor and career application, Young people don't have to make that false choice. If you want to be a construction worker, the courses you take in high school that uh, teach you geometry and algebra to learn to be a construction worker ought to be rigorous enough that if you change your mind and you decide as a junior, no, I want to apply to the University of California and be an engineer or a doctor, that you're not behind, that you're able to do so. And that's the concept of linked learning. I and if I may, we need a different definition of education reform in California than in this country. What do you mean? Right now, education reform is a, an unproductive fight, in my view, between those who are for the teachers' union and those who believe that the teachers' union are the problem. And some of the fights uh, are um, important issues about how easy it should be to fire a teacher, etc. It's the classic case of missing the forest through the trees. While because none of that focuses on the kids. On the kid. While the mm -hmm. partisans are arguing about those things, there's a whole agenda out there that we are missing, and that agenda is: how do we make a better connection between public education in the 21st century and the modern economy? And what are we doing to prepare young people for that modern economy? Look at the dropout rate. Look at the dropout rate for African Americans and Latinos. Look at the number of bit. You're a business leader. How many business leaders do you hear complain uh, every week and every month that the system isn't producing enough educated and trained workers? It's the third highest thing right behind the legislature passing laws oh, and well taxes. That, <laughs> well, that, those two things. But, but how about a new education reform agenda that focuses on what we teach and how we teach it and combines high standards and career application? Let me, let me throw something at you on this, okay? We had this higher education master plan, which yeah. some would say is in tatters today, okay? And but Has, part it hasn't of, been funded. Right. But part of the problem is, is that it, it, to many of us, it seems like our children are, are given a false choice, which is this. Either you go to college and you're a winner, or there's nothing for you. And so our whole focus is four-year university, and if you don't go there, you're kind of like a second-class citizen. And it writes off a huge part of our population and essentially says that it's not worth anything. I could not say it any better. I completely agree with you. Uh, the system is too one size fits all. Every kid should have an opportunity to go to college. And every kid should be required, in my view, to take the rigorous courses. We just have to have, in this state, with the ingenuity, the technology, the home of the Silicon Valley, why haven't we figured out 10 different ways to teach algebra, geometry, the basic sciences, even uh, history and English in ways that are, are relevant and applied to the leading growth sectors in the kind of young people, by the way, when we went to Long Beach, I did take the whole Senate to Long Beach, it was unprecedented, because I wanted them to see how Long Beach did it, and we were very impressed. And one of the things that you see when you go to a place like Long Beach, and Sacramento's doing a lot of this as well, you see kids come alive in the classroom when they understand that this boring subject that they have to learn has some real world application to what they might actually do with their lives. Well, that's amazing for them to come to life in the classroom. Yes. That's a, that's but we're just at the beginning why, of this movement, this, just the beginning. Why is this such a big issue for you, though? I mean, you're coming to the end of your pro temship, okay? Why is such a fire in the belly over this issue right now? Because I always have a cause. I have to have a cause. That's what <laughs> motivates me. Um, for me, I think what really drives me on this um, is the dropout rate. And what you said earlier, that there are too many kids who are being left out. Um, there are too many kids 
you know, uh, either without the parental support or, you know, who just come from a tough background who, you know, don't have as many pathways um, as I know I had as a young person. And we need to have pathways for every single kid. You know, the governor has put out, I think, a very uh, important and intelligent with some tweaks that we're negotiating on how to get more money to uh, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Right. That needs to be matched with an equally visionary policy on what we teach and how we teach. In our last 30 seconds, so, Senator, went fast. You're, com you're coming to the end of your pro tem ship. Yeah. What's next for Daryl Steinberg? I don't know yet, Scott. I mean, yeah. I, I really want to take my time and think about my options. I don't think I'm done with elective office in my lifetime. I hope not. But um, I, I, I think uh, there's a possibility that I will step out for a little while um, and, and do some other things. There are many ways to serve. All right. Well, we will stay tuned. And when you're ready to tell us, we'll, we'll I'll come back. You, come on back. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And that's our show. Thanks to Senator Daryl Steinberg for being our guest, and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.